Hi everyone and welcome to video number 21 on Weimar Germany and the rise of the Nazi party. And this video, ladies and gentlemen, is all about opposition to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. Now, think about some of the videos we've looked at. We've seen the Nazis set up their police state, very tightly controlled and organised. We've seen the SS set up. We've seen the Gestapo set up. Fear and terror controlling a lot of the German population. At the same time, we've seen the censorship, the propaganda, the persuasion of Joseph Goebbels controlling the population. So when we talk about opposition, we have to ask how many people actually wanted to stand against the Nazis, given the fact of the police state and the persuasion. Well, many of the Germans actually liked what Hitler was doing. He was re-establishing control where there had been chaos in the past. So some of the Germans actually supported what he was doing, so they would not oppose him. Also, many of the Germans liked the fact that he was clamping down on the communists. They were afraid of communism. So when the Nazis controlled and suppressed the communists, some Germans approved of that, so they won't oppose Hitler. Also, of course, some supported Hitler because he seems to be getting results. 1935, the Saar was returned to Germany. 1936, the Rhineland was demilitarized by the Treaty of Versailles. Hitler sent the soldiers back in in 1936. So some Germans are saying, aha, Hitler is delivering on his promises. We will support him. So given all of that, how many people would dare to oppose Hitler? And who were they? Well, some people did, unbelievably, given all that stacked against them, some people did oppose, some people did resist Hitler and the Nazis. Now, a couple of quick definitions. Resistance, there's a word. Refusal to support something and speak against it. You are resisting. It's slightly different to opposition. If you oppose something, you are actively doing something to remove it. So as we go through this video, try to remember that and then apply your thoughts. How many people were resisting Hitler's message and how many people were opposing it? I'll leave that for you to have a think about. Now, the first group, I've mentioned them in a previous video, the churches. Let's start with the Catholic Church. Now, if you remember, Hitler signed a, an agreement, a Concordat, 1933. Very quickly, he broke that. We've mentioned before, Pope Pius XI wrote a letter called With Burning Anxiety, and it was critical of what was going on in Nazi Germany. So the Catholic Church eventually does oppose and criticise Hitler. The Bishop of Munster, a man called von Galen, he criticised the Nazi racial pol policies. So there is some criticism, there is some people resisting, opposing Hitler and the Nazi ideas. And 400 Catholic priests end up in Dachau concentration camp in a building just for the priests. So there was opposition from the Catholic Church. Despite Hitler's reservations about the church, throughout the 1930s, there was high attendance at church. People still did go on a Sunday and listen to their priest. Now, is that opposition? Probably not. Is it resistance? Maybe. So the Catholic Church was resisting and opposing Hitler to some degree. That's the first group. The second group, the Protestants. Now, in a previous video, I mentioned the Pastors' Emergency League set up the confessional church led by a man called Martin Niemöller, a World War I veteran. Now, in the end, there were 6,000 pastors in this church 
compared to only 2,000 pastors or vicars who joined the Reich Church, if you like, Hitler's version of the church. So here we see 6,000 people standing against Hitler. That's quite a number. And Martin Niemöller, 1937, gave a very famous sermon criticising the Nazis. He's standing up against some of Hitler's policies. Of course, the Gestapo had tapped his phone. They were listening to his conversations. And Niemöller also was sent to the concentration camp. First of all, he was sent to Sachsenhausen and then transferred to Dachau, along with 800 Protestant pastors. Now, he actually survived the war. And after the war, he wrote a very famous poem. I suggest you go and have a look for that. Martin Niemöller, N I E. M O L L E R. So there was resistance and opposition from the Catholic Church and part of the Protestant Church as well. That's the first group of people who opposed Hitler. Now, the second group, we have to turn to the young people. The second group were the youth. Now, gives me a chance to wear my pirate hat. Edelweiss Pirates. The Edelweiss Pirates. About 2,000 of them. Young people. A loose band across many, many different cities. For example, in the city of Essen, they were called Travelling Dudes. But the Edelweiss Pirates. Rebellious teenagers. They rejected and did not like the discipline, the organisation of Nazism, particularly the Hitler Youth. And they would attack and beat up some members of the Hitler Youth. Or they would put anti-Nazi graffiti on the walls in the streets. Some, only some, helped escaped concentration camp prisoners. Now... They wore different sorts of clothes to your normal German youth at that time. White or Czech shirts, white socks. Sometimes they had badges on with the old skull and crossbones and a flower which grows in the Alps, the Edelweiss, Edelweiss pirates. OK, so here is a group who are actually banding together loosely and going against the discipline of the Nazis and the Hitler Youth. So, what else did they do? Well, they listened to music. Ooh, big deal, we say now. But back then, of course, Hitler didn't like certain types of music. And they listened to swing music, which was American. Now, what would Hitler and the Nazis do? Well, at first, they ignored them. They said, oh, they're just kids, they're not much of a threat. But some Edelweiss pirates then started to hand out anti-Nazi leaflets. Well, Hitler and his groups aren't going to stand for that. So some Edelweiss pirates were arrested and several were hanged in public as an example to others. So the Edelweiss pirates did provide some resistance, some opposition to Nazism and the Hitler Youth. So that's one group of youth. There was another group of young people called the Swing Youth, Swing from the music they listened to. Now these were richer people, mainly middle class. And again, they're rebelling against the tight control of the Nazis. And again, they were in different cities across Germany, for example, Berlin or Hamburg. Now, because they came from a richer background, they had access to American culture. They liked swing music, the Glenn Miller Orchestra, very famous uh, band leader at the time, had some great tunes such as In the Mood. Now, what did these young people do? They smoked, they drank alcohol, they went to dances. Now, you might not think that's very, very severe, but at the time, it was a challenge to the austerity and the discipline of Nazism and the Hitler Youth. 
Probably there were about 6,000 altogether of the swing youth, and they'd do these modern American dances like the jitterbug. Some of them liked jazz, but Hitler didn't, because he associated jazz with black people and Jews. So according to the Nazis, that is not acceptable music. But the swing youth liked it. The Nazis viewed the swing youth almost as if they were degenerate, terrible people. Just remove the pirate's hat there. But again, the Nazis saw them as no real threat, more a nuisance. Occasionally they would crack down on them and some swing youth were arrested and sent to the concentration camps. So they're the second group opposing Hitler. We've had the churches and then we've had the young people. Now I mentioned concentration camps. 1933 to 1939, 1 1.3 million people were sent to the camps. 300,000 people left Nazi Germany. So you could argue that the reason why there wasn't much of a threat, why there wasn't really much opposition to Hitler, is that people were either imprisoned in the camps or they'd left Germany. They weren't allowed to remain free in Germany and speak out against the Hitler regime. A third group. Some people in the army did criticise Hitler. Some of the army generals. Hitler's response to that, what do you think? That's correct. By 1938, 16 generals had been removed. So again, Hitler is clamping down. And if there's any resistance, if there's any opposition to his authority, he will deal with it. The final part of the video, assassination attempts. Throughout Hitler's life, yes, there were many, many attempts to kill him. Now, the period we're studying, just for the exam, 1933 to 1939, <clears throat> some of the more serious assassination attempts actually occurred after that, 1944, during Second World War, a very serious attempt by the army. But that's not for us. We won't need that in our exam. So I'll just concentrate on three which fit into our time scale. First one, 1935 to 1936, some Jewish students plans. They say, right, I think we've got to act and assassinate Hitler. But the plans were very poorly thought through. They went absolutely nowhere. They came to nothing. It was an attempt, but a very feeble attempt. The first assassination attempt, it pretty much went nowhere. Second one, 1938, a man called Bavo, B-A-V-A-U-D. Now, he was at a Nazi parade in Munich with a rifle. It was there. He decided at the last minute not to fire. He said he didn't want to hurt other people nearby, but it was a more credible attempt. It went nowhere, no shots were fired. That's the second, a man called Bavo. The third and final assassination attempt in our time period, November 1939, was the most serious. What happened? A man called Elsa, E-L-S-E-R. He put a bomb in a beer hall in Munich, the same beer hall that Hitler had used to start the Munich Beer Hall Putsch back in 1923. The very same hall, there is a bomb. Hitler spoke in that building at that time where the bomb was there. Hitler left early. The bomb exploded. Eight people were killed. 62 were injured, Hitler was not present, so obviously he survived, but that was a more credible and a more serious assassination attempt, the third one, a man called Elsa. 
So we see that there was some opposition there. Some people were prepared to actually try and do something actively to get rid of Hitler. But on the whole, Hitler had control. The fear, the terror, the persuasion, the propaganda. Many people liked what he was doing, re-establishing Germany, getting success, crushing the communists. Put all that together and we see why there was not much opposition to Hitler. Now, what could they ask you in an exam? Explain why there was opposition to the Nazi regime or where did the opposition come from? Or you could use this video. What would you write about? A paragraph on the Catholic Church, a paragraph on the Protestant Church. You could also mention the assassination attempts, the swing youth, the Edelweiss pirates. So there was opposition, not much, but there was opposition to Hitler. There was resistance to Hitler, not much, for all the reasons I've just explained. So ladies and gentlemen, that finishes the third section of the course. We've only got one section left now, section four, and that's what we're going to move to next. And what's that all about? Looking at Nazi Germany once Hitler is in control. Life in Nazi Germany, 1933 to 1939. What was it like for women and families? What was it like for children and the youth? What was it like for the minorities? Well, I'll explain all of that in the next few videos. As ever, -ah! I hope it's been useful. Terrible impression. Just stop that immediately. I'll speak to you soon. All the best now. See you later.